We're here tonight to discuss Gary, a uh, sequel to Titus Andronicus. And you can laugh now if you want. <laughs> uh, first, I'll introduce the author of the play, Taylor Mack, who is, as I'm sure you know, an acclaimed singer, musician, performer, um, whose epic 24-decade history of popular music production was truly one of the most remarkable theatrical feats in recent theatrical history, if not of all time. <laughs> it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, justly so, but he has a history of writing many plays, performing many solo works. Anyway, welcome Taylor Mack. You need sight lines. Hi. All right. Next, I'll introduce George C. Wolfe, who is one. I mean, all these people don't need to be introduced, but anyway, briefly, he won two Tony Awards for directing, one for the landmark production of Angels in America by Tony Kushner. He most recently directed the Broadway revival of Iceman Cometh. <clears throat> He was the head of the public theater from 1993 to 2005, playwright, book writer, actor too, um, <laughs> and basically that's enough to say about George C. Wolfe. There's a lot more. Anyway, welcome George Wolfe. <laughs> and to invoke the cliche, last but not least, Nathan Lane is one of the consummate actors of his generation. You know, three Tony Awards, um, the latest, of course, for his performance is Roy Cohn in Angels in America. He can do comedy, musical comedy, uh, heavy drama, uh, pretty much anything, and he can even do this play, Gary, which is gonna be a very interesting challenge for him. Anyway, film, television, one of our greatest actors, Nathan Lane. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very kind of you. So I'm going to start uh, just briefly introducing the play, basically. Um, Gary Colon, I believe. A sequel to Titus Andronicus. You're laughing already, as I said. You know, Titus Andronicus, as most of you know, is mainly known for the extremely high level of violence in the play. It makes King Lear's bloodletting look like a day at the Indiana State Fair. <laughs> Not that I've been there, but... Um, and it's been in and out of fashion over the years. It was popular in its initial presentation, uh, considered his earliest tragedy. And then for a couple hundred years, it was not performed at all because Shakespeare scholars sort of disdained it as being, I don't know, vulgar, too violent. But in the last half of the 20th century, I think I was there, um, it, you know, its reputation was restored. Interesting directors, Peter Brook among them, found material in this play that they felt actually reflected, you know, the violence of that particular century, you know, between, I don't need to really tell you what happened in the 20th century. Um, so it's really come back and I think it's very interesting that this play is now being, you know, rediscovered. Um, but it's nobody's favorite Shakespeare play. Is anyone in here? Can you raise your hand? It, <laughs> and not a single hand. So it's quite interesting that you've chosen this particular play to uh, riff on, shall we say. Um, so my first question to you is... Um, Why? Yes. <laughs> well, I was, I was going to say, what were you thinking? But it's the same idea. But 
you know, I'd also like to know your opinion of Titus itself, the play, uh -huh. and then why you felt that, how you found the impulse to do this sequel. Yeah. Um, well, I'll start with the impulse, right? So, uh, uh, I want, I feel like right now in our political climate, we're living in a revenge tragedy. Uh, that is trying to be a comedy, <laughs> but I'm isn't failing. succeeding, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and um, and I, I wanted to write a, a play about that. Um, and I thought, do I want to write a revenge on revenge tragedy? Uh, and and wh what other... Um, and what would that look like, uh, really, a revenge on revenge tragedy, um, something that didn't perpetuate revenge? <laughs> uh, and then I, I so I, I looked at the canon and um, the one that popped out as uh, a revenge tragedy, which is also a comedy, uh, was Titus. And um, because it's so over the top and because he uh, was really exploring escalation in the play more than anything else, I think. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just curious about that in our particular day and age, uh, um, how escalation is uh, taking over and how hyperbole and um, our norms are kind of uh, going away. And um, so I, 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 that's what I wanted to write a play about. And when I, I looked at Titus, I thought, well, um, I, I fell in love with a particular character in Titus Andronicus, which is probably the, the, the smallest character in the play, and I decided to write a play about that character. Um, and uh, that's, that was the, kind of the impulse. There's, uh, there's more dramatic versions of that impulse, but for now that's good. And, uh, and as, as, in terms of my opinions about Titus Andronicus, I, I, I like it fine. Um, I, have, I have issues with the way it treats uh, Lavinia. Um, I ha in terms of, I mean, not just the literal things that happened to her, but in terms of making a comedy or uh, sacrificing a woman for the entertainment of it um, is, I find, in this day and age when you can't, you just change the channel and you see um, 40 women uh, dead uh, on every station uh, in our entertainment, I find that um, uh, unappealing at the least. And uh, I, I find it unimaginative and I find it disturbing too, um, and I think that that ties into a little bit about what's going on in terms of our misogyny and the culture and what just happened with the election and blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I have my issues uh, with it being performed now, kind of uh, without that being addressed in some way, uh, and. But half of the play is, or about a third of the, the first third of the play, they kind of argue was written by Peel um, and not uh, Shakespeare. And you can s kind of see it because the, the last two thirds of the play get much better. And, um, <laughs> and much more fun too. <laughs> and much more fun and more engaged thematically. And so I guess that's my, I have mixed feelings about it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Long answer. Nathan, I'll go to you because you're playing the title character. Intriguingly named Gary. I can't figure out that, but we shall ask him later. What appealed to you about this character, this play? It's a very unusual play, as I need hardly tell you. Um, well, it, uh, just so you understand, uh, the, um, this uh, so-called sequel uh, stars three extremely minor characters from Titus, uh, the, the clown the, and the maid and the midwife who are both offstage characters but are mentioned. And, but in this play, they're the stars of the show and they're called Gary, Janice, and Carol. Classic Shakespearean names. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, you know, it started because Scott Rudin uh, sent me the script and said, I think this is I an incredible piece, and I, I thought of you. And, and, you know, it was... 
it was just so bold and fresh and original. And I, it was obviously intelligent and funny, but it was like, um, you know, I started to, uh, but I really had to think about it because I, I read it. I read it a couple of times, and and there were parts of it where I, I felt like, you know, Bert Lahr when he when he read Waiting for Gatto, and he said, I don't know if I understand it all, but um, I have the nagging suspicion that this might be important. <laughs> <laughs> So there was a little bit of that going on. Some, some parts of it, I was like, it was, it was hard to follow, and yet it was, it was compelling. And and I thought, well, yes, this is incredibly um, risky to do this on Broadway, because essentially we're doing a downtown show, uptown. And but I thought it was refreshing, and I thought, yes, this is a this is a voice that should be heard, and. Um, and it, I knew it would be a, a great adventure. And then we, you know, I, I, I said to Scott, we, you know, we have to get George C. Wolfe because, you know, he's, he's the best there is. And, um, and then we, um, and, and fortunately, Scott was able to talk him into it. <laughs> he's, he's very, very persuasive, persuasive <laughs> Scott Luton. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, which has been, that's been one of the, the high points of this is just getting to work with George, because he is. He's, the, he's brilliant and, and inspiring and the, really the most entertaining person to be in a room with. Um, he's, you know, he has more energy than anyone, and then one minute he's on the floor lounging, and then the next minute he's hanging from a lighting fixture and <laughs> giving you direction, and then he's over here, he's over there. He's like a cat. He's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been, you know, that's been just uh, a joy to go to work every day with him. And, and um, so knowing that those, that the, these were the kinds of people who would be involved, the, the, the whole design team, Anne Roth and Sandra LaQuasto and uh, Jules and uh, Fisher and Peggy, or, it was just uh, the notion of being able to collaborate with that level of talent was just um, irresistible. And, um, and it's the, the most exciting part is that I have no idea how people will react to this. <laughs> and that's really exciting because you think, you know, it's, 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 um, it's really sort of what we need. And it's funny, Jason Zinneman wrote this piece uh, the, uh, that I read the other day about how the theater isn't it just doesn't do comedy anymore because it's all being done on in television and in stand up and and uh, that the theater used to be a place where you, you know there were comedies and then television sort of took it over with the situation comedy but this um, it sort of seems like a great time to do what is a it, it's a comedy but it's not I the, the funny thing is people keep coming up to me and they seem very excited about it but I, I the feeling I get is that it's oh this is a funny thing happened on the way to Titus Andronicus <laughs> <laughs> and it's oh it's so not <laughs> It's so not that, although there are some very funny things in it, and, and, uh, um, but it's so, it's so, it's much darker and quirkier, and, uh, you know, it's just got a, there's sort of a, you know, a, 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 an undercurrent of Beckett's and a sprinkling of Ionesco, and, and uh, George was saying, was, it reminded him a little today of, uh, of uh, the Thornton Wilder play, um, Skin, of Skin of Our mm -hmm. Teeth, you know, it just has... It's so it's that's I think I think people will be in for a pleasant surprise. I hope they will be. Well, George, I'm not going to ask you to swing from a chandelier. There's <laughs> none available. You could do a cat move here, but yeah, yeah. Um, he basically said that you're very excited about this production, and I'd like to know why. I mean, you've directed Shakespeare. Uh, this is Shakespeare inspired, but it's also a really kind of rollicking slapstick black comedy too. Yeah. So tell me about your reactions to it. Well, I think one of the things that, that I like, that I love about the piece, aside from the language mm. and aside from this kind of raw, unapologetic theatricality that also has underneath it extraordinary fragility, I love the fact that it is about, it, there's a line, three disposable people. And through the course of the play, they realize they are not disposable. 
and it and it and and it and, and people whose society has pushed aside or in Shakespeare's case pushed them off the page are center stage and they claim their own lives and they claim their own power and they claim their own agency while being inside of this burlesque that we're all living inside of these days which is dumb people in power <laughs> you know and so you know, and so it's, uh, I'm sure I don't know who you mean I, by that. Well, I, Could you I'm clarify, about everybody, please? Everybody, not specifically, but you know, it's it's that yeah. that people that people that discarded people realize their center stage, and that's and and some of them fully claim center stage. Others don't want it. Uh, others hide, but at the same time want to be seen. So I love so so I love that, and I and and I love that it's a kind of. Uh, it's 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 foolish and it's raw and and all theater I think should be that way, hmm. you know. And because life sure as hell is, so so it'd be nice if that dynamic was that. And you know, and it's you know, it's fun to it's fun to play with very funny and very 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 smart people. And and I get to do that every day with the cast. I get to do that every every day with the cast. And that's it's so that's thrilling. Well, and you mentioned something that is the theme throughout the play, um, or, you know, subtly woven throughout the play. You know, the elite, you know, the emperors and the people who, you know, have ruled society in the Roman Empire and since, um, they frequently, you know, crash and burn and sort of ruin things. And it's left for other people to pick things up and that's what I find kind of moving about the play. That's, I assume, one reason why you sort of wrote it. Yeah, I was, I'm more interested in who has to do the cleanup mm. uh, than who makes the mess. And, um, and, I, and I feel in this, you know, he's going to get out of office eventually, and we're going to have to clean up. Uh, and some people are going to have to clean up more um, and get paid less for it. Uh, and um, so I, I just wanted to consider that. I really think the play is really just about cleaning, but it's, uh, it's, it's really that. That's what it is. It, it, it's like, how do you clean? Who has to clean uh, specifically, but also primarily, how do you clean? Mm -hmm. And that is the, uh, and not just a room, but uh, an entire empire. Um, and so that's, to me, what the characters are grappling with. Right. You know? And Gary in particular, um, he starts out, it's just, wait, I'm a clown. Yay, I got an upgrade to a maid. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I'm looking for that. But anyway, um, <laughs> but he evolves through the play to have greater ambitions. Um, how do you describe those ambitions? Um, well, he's, uh, uh, Gary is a, a, a street clown. Uh, he comes from a long line of of, act, of terrible clowns, <laughs> he, and he, he's not really good at it. But it was a fa the family business, so these <laughs> these awful routines were passed on down to him, and so he tries, and he he is met with a a, a lot of awful reactions to his act, and um, so and and then because of what happens in Titus Andronicus, this character is sent off to be hanged, and. And in our play, we find out that he has talked his way out of the hanging and offered to help clean up after this coup, this Titus Andronicus coup. And, and they, because it, it's all so arbitrary anyway, they, why they decide to, to hang him, they say, okay, yeah, go, you know, collect the emperor and clean up, help clean up the mess. And so he's sent to the house of Titus Andronicus where the maid, Janice, has been, um, uh, who works to, uh, every day cleaning up all these dead bodies. This, the house is now being used as a storage space, so the banquet room is filled with nothing but dead bodies. <laughs> and, um, but he's very excited because um, this, uh, this near-death experience has been an awakening for him uh, of emotions because he's basically, in order to survive, he's been sort of numb to, uh, to 
to doing this job that he's not happy doing and is not met with any success whatsoever. And he's very excited about starting this day as a, as a maid. It's a real step up for him. <laughs> It's very endearing, and he's very excited because it turns out that Janice is his next door neighbor. They've known each other for years, and he thinks, you know, it, this will not only is this a step up, but it's I'll be working with a friend. And then Janice is a is a very severe person <laughs> who has survived all these years by remaining anonymous and just doing her job and not questioning anything. So this is a person who comes in with a, a sen the sense of possibility that anything is possible now if you speak up for yourself mm. and, and you, could, you could save your own life. And, and his dream is that he has kept hidden, which he eventually reveals to Janice, is that he would like to become a fool. <laughs> Which Another is, upgrade, which apparently. Is, which is, a, you know, is, is a, it's like a clown, but a step up. <laughs> a clown with ambition, he says. <laughs> and because the, uh, fools are, uh, have empathy and they, and they try to influence people in power by, by not only in, insulting them, but, you, you, you know, using their wit to guide them and, and, and ultimately to help save the world in their, in their own way. So, so what you see is when he comes in at the beginning, uh, the, the evolution of Gary is sort of, he's, a, you know, he's very upbeat and excited and, and he's an innocent. And what you see, uh, certainly the way he'll be costumed is the, the, the remains of his clown outfit and sort of, he's very dirty. And, and um, it's ancient Rome, you know, and so there's, the, there, there's sort of the remains of uh, his clown uh, uh, face and, the, and, and, and he has a wig. And, and eventually as the play goes on and he starts to reveal more of his emotions, it starts to lead him to use his intellect in a way that he never has. And it starts to inspire him. And so slowly as the play goes on, you know, the wig comes off and he cleans his face and he kind of grows up before your eyes. And, um, and, and it's these two, um, uh, it's a battle of wills, really, um, because Janice w wants no part of this. Uh, she just wants to get on with the work, because if they don't finish cleaning all these bodies and, and st stacking them up, uh, they will be killed, because it's, that's the kind of society they live in. It's so violent and brutal. Uh, so it's... Um, yeah, that's that's part of the fun of it, and <laughs> <laughs> it's it's sort of tracking, tracking how he start. He seems in the beginning you think, oh, he's a little dim, but he he's he's not. He's just been so shut off from everything. So he's like a child in many ways. And then you see him sort of grow up, and he sort of starts to manipulate the situation because he sees Janice is 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 just. Uh, is like a brick wall, and so he has to sort of break her down and try to get her on his side. And um, uh, yeah, no, that's and obviously to, to you know working with Andrea Martin, who's not, not only a great great actress and comedian, but just a, a very old friend of mine. So it, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, wonderful thing to to be able to share this w with her. Well, you touched on some elements that I'm kind of intrigued by because I've only read the play. Um, but some of the stage directions say things like, there are a thousand corpses piled on stage. Um, so I feel like this is an intensely difficult play and at some point you have to climb up on top of a pile of corpses. Yes, yeah. So for all of you, I'm curious, like, obviously your imagination just went crazy. You said, <laughs> anything can be done time. on Broadway. Well, <laughs> and to great effect. But um, making this work on stage seems a particularly challenging thing. And you're now a couple of weeks away from your first previews. How's it going? I mean, is it, is it proving as difficult as it would seem to me on stage? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is challenging. Yeah, it is physically challenging. And, uh, and, but uh, for some reason, maybe because I'm just getting old, <laughs> I'm not worried. 
<laughs> you know, I, I, I just sort of, you know, it's sort of like, this is one where you think, well, we're going to be flying by the seat of our pants in the beginning because it's just, it's an enormous, uh, the, between the dead bodies with, that, ha that have blood and fe uh, feces in them and, yeah. and, and there are two. I wasn't going to go into the feces, but thank yeah. you for... <laughs> no, well, there's a whole section where um, Andrea has to, she, Janice teaches Gary... Uh, how to clean these bodies, and it's very elaborate. <laughs> and she, you have to get out all the excess gas out of the dead body, and then you have to cut them open and stick tubes in to get out the blood and the feces, and you don't want to mix up the tubes, or you get a face full of fluid that you don't want. And, <laughs> and there's, it's, so it's kind of gruesome, and, uh, and, but hilarious. And, and, uh, and then Gary realizes this is not what he wants to do with his life. <laughs> as excited as he was only moments before, he, had, he finds immense disappointment in, in being a maid. Um, <laughs> and so, so um, but there, the physical production is, yeah, there's, I can't even, if I told you everything, you would just, you'd run out and buy a ticket. <laughs> 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 I can't tell you all the things that happen in this play. That, um, uh, but uh, yes, it's, it, we have a lot of work to do in the next couple of weeks. But yeah. it, it's, it's, it's exciting because just the notion of, uh, I can't wait to sort of hear how, what, how people react to this. Yeah, and for you, George, is this a uniquely challenging physical production? You've done musicals, big musicals, small musicals. Is this one sort of pushing you in a direction that you've never been before, or? I, would, I don't know if it's pushed me in the direction, it's just there are more props <laughs> <laughs> than like the seven penises. shows combined. So it's, 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 a, it's, 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 it's a burlesque, it's a burlesque. And, and, and so it's a burlesque of of violence, it's a burlesque of, the, of, 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 of foolishness, it's a burlesque of these two people. And, and one of the things that I think is really fascinating about it is Gary is a creature of chaos. His power and his sense of spirit comes from chaos, and Janice is a creature of order. Hmm. And, and so it really, in some respects, the play is about what happens when chaos and order collide. And, and so, and so the, the physical production is a reflection of that. So it's, it's, it's huge and, and, and bodies that do all kinds of tricks. And at the same time, it's got this intricate, you know, smart, funny, dark, edgy, available language. And so it's the, I think that's the, that's the fun and that's the challenge combining the physical burlesque with this very, very, very smart, funny language and getting and figuring out how those two things dance together. Yeah. I think that's the challenge and that's, that's what's really hard about it and that's what's really fun about it. Well, inspiring. Um, the language is intriguing because you do uh, rhyming verse, non-rhyming verse, mm -hmm. and then you do, you know, Janice is like, what the hell are you saying? You're rhyming. What, what the hell is that about? Um, so you're doing all these levels of, you know, <laughs> language. And was that on, obviously it was on purpose, but what was that meant to convey? And um, well, you know, in Shakespeare, Shakespeare, often the, the, the characters that speak in verse are the higher class mm -hmm. and um, um, the lower class speak in prose. And that's not always the case, but you know, it's primarily how it is. And I, I just kind of felt that um, Gary is, he's got this aspiration. And so he doesn't even know necessarily at first when he's speaking in um, the rhyming couplets, uh, but it, it's coming out of him um, to, to, to dream big, maybe for the first time. So I wanted his language to reflect that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Janice is so, you know, grounded and not uh, ambitious uh, and has very little aspiration other than to do her job and do it really well. Um, so she, she I, I didn't think it was right for her, although um, at some point she does 
well, that's spoiler. She does break into some yeah. blank verse. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a very complicated play as we've established because you're, you know, you have slapstick at some points, you have very refined language, you have these moral issues. Let's speak about more <clears throat> how the moral issues may relate to what's going on in the world today. I mean, all the main characters are of the, you know, what you would call the lower classes. Their world is decimated by, you know, this intense amount of warfare. You know, is that something you want people to take away or is that a subtle thing that is supposed to be, you know, incidental to the entertainment value or was this really why you were convinced you needed to write this play? Um, I mean, I never really want to provide an audience with answers for anything. Oh, um, I hate it when they say that. <laughs> I know, don't you hate that? Uh, so, but I do think it's really fascinating to watch people attempt um, things, and so I guess I wanted to give, write some characters who are um, attempting to uh, break into a certain kind of consciousness that they haven't had before and um, see what happens to them when, when that happens. And um, I don't know if that really answers your question. Yeah, but. certainly. And there's also a line about uh, how autocracy, or rather democracy, can fade into autocracy, which I felt was very resonant. I mean, but all of it's fairly subtle because you have all these other layers that are so removed from our contemporary world. Yeah. But I think in some ways, it's easier to take these lessons in, not lessons, but you know, these meanings in when they're not shoved in your face, so. Yeah, and I mean, I, I believe in metaphor, you know, I like yeah. it, I like to play in it. So um, I, I like to just drop it in a little bit and let people pick up what they want to pick up, mm. but then let the story be its own thing as well. Um, but I, yeah, I'm not interested in uh, the Roman Empire. I'm interested in right now. Um, so uh, I, but I recognize that the Roman Empire has a lot to um, um, give us in terms of our considerations of what's happening right now. So uh, that, that to me was what was more fun about it. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> That's it. One of my favorite lines is at one point Gary says, it's a democracy, sort of. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think we can all relate to that at this moment. <laughs> um, but uh, right now you're a few weeks away. What are the new challenges? I mean, this is about the process. Um, Nathan, what are you finding hardest to achieve at this point? The physical part, you said, you know, um, or is it the language or well, I mean, you know the play has been evolving and we're so there are changes and and uh, No, at this point we've been we've been working um, Sections of the play, but we haven't uh, been able to have a, a lot of run-throughs and that that's what, what will really tell me what uh, what the play will require in, in terms of stamina and and um, and just also where you, where you start to figure out where you know you're working too hard or you don't you know what 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 the what you need to do and and um, and and on you know unfortunately uh, um, you know you don't really start to find that kind of stuff out until you're in front of an audience, mm -hmm. but um, yeah it's just in terms of the physical demands that that's because there's a, a whole thing that happens at the end that's very physical. And and so you want to you, you want to have a few uh, uh, shots at that and and uh, to, so we, you get a, a sense of how the the whole play moves. But um, I mean, but uh, you know, it's every play is like this. You you're always you wish you had a little more time and and um, uh, because uh, you know you know it's uh, this is a play that. Um, you know, I, you have your own notion of, how, of what this is in, the, in, in terms of tone and style, and then, and then, of course, you know, on, on March 5th, uh, an audience will, t will immediately tell you what what this is. You, you may have thought it was one thing, but they'll they'll tell you wh what it really is, and then, and and so it's, uh, 
Yeah, right now it's just about you know getting into the theater, and also we've been working in a rehearsal room with sort of um, an approximation of the mound of bodies. So we'll have the real mound of bodies. And which has a whole thing where I, you know, I, I have to, I, I slip and I slide, there's a slide inside of it and I, and I slide all the way down and land on a fat guy at the bottom um, that I sort of use as a chair through the play. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's, so there's all sorts of physical things to, to be worked out in dealing with the real, you know, we've been dealing with, you know, bodies which are a lot lighter. And now we're going to have, now the real bodies are much heavier and, and um, <laughs> you know, this, I don't know if you want to know stuff like this. At one point I'm, I'm pressing a body to get out all the flatulence and then, and then I hit the body and I, I said, if for, in order for this moment to end, I said I should hit the body and then his penis should fly up and, and it pe pees in my face. <laughs> I said, that, that's a good finish for this. <laughs> and I said, can they do that? Can they make the penis rise up and then and pee on me? And they said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And, I, and so, so I have to stick my hand inside the body, and I, there's a little ball, and I turn it, and the penis comes up, <laughs> and I squeeze the ball, and it hits me in the face with water. <laughs> this is what's called process, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Well, clearly Broadway is in for something exactly. new. Um, a Jacobian moment, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, bringing up that subject of the intense, you know, it's scatological, it's every other illogical thing you can mention. Um, how do you feel this, you know, how do you negotiate that as a director with all this intense, physical comedy going on, and you mentioned the language. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a moment-to-moment -moment thing, or do you just trust your actors to somehow find their way through it, or? No, I think you have to, I mean, I mean, it's, it, as, as, as it's, I don't, I don't even, I was gonna say stylistically shifts, but I don't think that's really the case. I think, I think the stakes keep shifting, and if you can locate what they want, what they're looking for, what they need, what, they, what they're scared of, that informs all the choices and, 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 and it creates an order. So I think what you're perpetually looking for is, is a truth that is underneath all the choices because I think that truth is underneath the language. And so you're watching people once again, one of the, th the things that I think was really, you're watching people discover after the world has told them that they have no potency, their own potency. So that's what you're watching. I mean, you're mm -hmm. watching, you know, outrageousness and silliness and vulnerability and rage and all these other things happening. But the thing that you're really watching are you watching these people discover who they are and that because they are stuck in one position in society, those are the circumstances that have happened to them. That's not a definition of their worth. And I think that's what you're really, so, you're, so that's the thing that, 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 and that's what's really thrilling to have people who are brilliantly funny and brilliantly true. Because those, it's, it's that, those two things are dancing together. And that's what creates, I think, a, cohesive isn't the right word, but he creates an, a, a, a grounded journey while it seems to be flying between Mars and Venus and, you know, Uranus, but um, hello, but you know what I mean? So it's, you know, that is what they want. It's what they want and discovering what they are capable of as human beings. Mm -hmm. And Taylor, I'm curious, it's more a pedestrian question, but, you know, Titus Andronicus is not a well-known play to many Broadway theater goers. Um, so how much do you think audiences actually need to know? Do they need to... Well, they don't need to know anything <laughs> about Titus Andronicus. Really, well, they don't. Uh, because you wrote into the play certain... I wrote a little uh, exposition from Titus into the play, which mm -hmm. I think Nathan might... Well, I don't know, he might be wonderful. Uh, but, uh, 
but it, it's just not, you just don't need to, you don't need to read Titus Andronicus. You can, I'm not stopping you. But um, <laughs> it's not necessary uh, in order to understand this. It wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt. Josh, take a look. No, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's pretty clear, you know. Uh, it's pretty clear pretty early on. I mean, Nathan even has a line that, uh, Gary has a line that is, you know, all you need to know is this, you know. And so, um, and so I think it, it calms everybody down pretty early. Yeah. yeah. It's not going to turn people off. Titus Andronicus, what the hell right. is that? Kind right, right, right. No. Um, you know, at one point Gary mentions his ambition as bringing an end to tragedy. I don't know if I just made that up. Um, by staging this bizarre spectacle involving, spoiler, dead bodies. Um, <laughs> I mean, the meaning of that is so interesting to me. Is the play trying to illustrate, and I know you don't want to put meanings on it, but the idea that um, art or some form of it can somehow heal or, you know, regenerate the world after these massive tragedies have taken place? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's an okay meaning to take. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, Just I think okay. that's a good one. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell my dramatic story, uh, which is that I finished my 24-hour concert. Um, uh, it was one of the great experiences of my life. It was also one of the more exhausting experiences of my life. Um, and then two weeks later, uh, well, and then I, I had to fly almost immediately to... Um, to my mom's home in Orange County, California, uh, and do hospice work for her while she was dying. And then the election happened, and two days later she died. And then I went to Mexico to kind of decompress from everything that had happened. And I was jogging on the beach at, um, before anyone else was up, and a corpse washed up onto the shore. And I, I just kind of, I just kind of sat there on the beach, um, and. Uh, I thought, I got to do something with all of this. Um, so I gave myself a challenge to put all the horrible things in the world on one stage and see if I could make something good out of it. And so it's not so much that we do. I don't know, maybe we will, I hope so. But, um, but it's more the, the attempt is uh, what I want the art to be. Yeah, it's the challenge of making art somehow, not necessarily shape the world, but react to it in a realistic, meaningful way. Yeah, yeah. And um, just having read the play, I think it certainly does that. Um, do we have enough time before the performance begins? <laughs> the performance. Um, you know, I think it's about time for y'all to saddle up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not okay. literally, okay. but. <laughs> I think Let's just, we could just... Read Excuse it. that metaphor. Um, well, is, you sound like we're going to read from Sam Shepard. Um, <laughs> this is... We're I'm not reading from anything. Saddle um, up. Um, but in fact, sure. Taylor, do you want to introduce this? Yeah, scene? so I, I thought we didn't really want to give away too much of the play. <laughs> so um, we thought we would just read the scene from Titus Andronicus where this clown... Gary, um, where he's, um, he, Shakespeare he's doesn't call Gary him Gary, but uh, he's called Clown. Um, and they call him Sira, which is, uh, means every man. Gary has a line at some point in, the, in uh, my play, which is, uh, uh, he describes himself as an every man who's a nobody else. Um, but, uh, so we thought we would just read this, to, just to show you how small his part is in uh, Shakespeare. There's two short little scenes. I'll read Titus Andromachus, and, uh, and Nathan will do Gary. So, enter a clown with a basket and two pigeons in it. News, news from heaven. Marcus, the post is come. Sira, what tidings? Have you any letters? Shall I have justice? What says the sky? Oh, well, my lord, I can't say I've much say for one as I as you. But what says Jupiter, I ask you? Alas, sir, I know not Jupiter. I never drank with him in all my life. 
Why, villain, are not you the carrier? I of my pigeon, sir. <laughs> Nothing else. Why, did you not come from heaven? From heaven? Alas, sir, I never came there. God forbid I should be so bold to hope for heaven in me young days. Why, I am going with my pigeons <laughs> to the tribunal court to take up a matter of a brawl betwixt me uncle and one of the imperial's men. Tell me, can you deliver an oration to the emperor with a grace? Nay, truly, sir, I could never say grace in all me life. Sirrah, come hither. Make no more excuse, but give your pigeons to the emperor. By me, you shall have justice at his hands. Hold, hold. Meanwhile, here's money for your charges. Give me pen and ink. Aye, sir. Then here is a supplication for you. And when you come to him, at the first approach, you must kneel, then kiss his foot, then deliver up your pigeons, and then look for your reward. I'll be at hand, sir. See you do it bravely. I warrant you, sir. Let me alone. Sirrah, have you a knife? Come, let me see it. Here, Marcus, fold it in the oration, for you will make it like a humble gift. And when you've given it the emperor, knock at my door and tell me what he says. God be with you, sir, I will. So the clown exits. There's a little scene with Saturninus, the emperor, and the empress, Tamara. And, uh, and I'll do Tamara and Saturninus and get, enter a clown. How now, good fellow? Would you speak with us? Yea, forsooth. <laughs> Ain't your mistership the imperial? Empress I am, but yonder sits the emperor. Oh, tis he. God and Saint Stephen give you good evening. I have brought you a letter and a couple of pigeons here. Saturninus, the emperor, reads the letter. Go take him away and hang him presently. I'll <laughs> How much tip do I get? <laughs> Come, Sarah, you must be hanged. Hanged? 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 By a lady? Then I have brought up a neck to a fair end. And that's it. <laughs> so, I... So I read, when I read that, those two little scenes, I thought, that's who I'm most interested in. Um, and I wanted to write a play about him. You like the underdogs. <laughs> anyway, thank you. That gives us a taste of your inspiration and uh, a taste of your lovely cockney or whatever the hell that was. Um, it's a very challenging role for you because of the shifts in... Uh, rhetorical language, but anyway, we look forward to it, and we know you will be up to it. Um, but I hope this uh, event has given you a taste of how interesting this play is, how challenging, audacious, um, you know, inspiring in its way, uh, possibly terrifying too, if, you know, if things go wrong, um, because it's a very logistically complicated play. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for, you know, coming to talk about it and giving us a hint of what we are in for. But uh, really, until you see it on stage, you won't know what this play really, what really has. I mean, as you can tell, you're probably all bewildered, like, what? <laughs> Dead bodies by the dozens? Anyway, no, it's an intensely interesting piece of writing. And it's great to see a new American play on Broadway. Absolutely. Amen. And I think that was my exit line, so. <laughs> Unless anyone would like to add something? No, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody.